Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Until now we have only looked at the uniform torsion well if you think about the application example we did that is actually a non uniform torsion that in different parts of the shaft you have you know different uh, torques which are acting but even in that case the what the problem specifically asked uh, we looked at you know individual segments we did not look at the the phi or the angle of twist of the entire segment so part by piece by piece the shaft is still uniform but when you zoom out and you look at the shaft as a whole in that particular case it is a case of the non uniform this particular topic what we are going to focus on in lecture we will look at non uniform torsion on how to compute the angle of twist and so on and we will also look at indeterminate problem and your savior for this topic you will be surprised to hear this your savior for this particular topic is going to be what you have learned in the pure axial loading now as i as i told in the beginning of the you know this lecture or in the introduction is that although these loading condition are more or less completely different one of them deals with you know just pulling or pushing right and the other one deals with torsion although these loading conditions are different there are certain analogies that can be drawn in terms of how the deformations happen that will help you immensely just analogically to derive that what is going to be the angle of twist or some of the other parameters which are let's go ahead and first take a look to what is the analogy and then let's see that how this analogy will help us in solving easily solving the problems related to torsion so first i would like to jog your memory into what we have already learned before we have learned the axial case and we have learned the the uniform torsion case in the you know, last uh, a couple of lectures that you have seen now for the axial case remember this was our axial case very simple a bar which load p at one end and the p at the other end to keep equilibrium for this one what we had seen that our delta remember delta was the deformation of the bar was equals to p times l divided by a times e right very simple p l divided by a e now if you recall what we learned in the torsion until now that our phi that is the angle of twist remember the torsion formula the last thing that we derived phi is equal to p times l divided by a times g now can you start seeing the analogy in between these two formulas over here take a look again delta is here and here is phi so both are somehow measurements of deformation in some sense and delta is the longitudinal displacement phi is the angle of twist so some measure of deformation right then coming to the right hand side here you have p which is the applied force and here you have t which is the applied torque right both of these formulas depend upon the length of the member l so here i have the length of the member l here i have the length of the member l over here now let's come to the denominator in the denominator here you have a correspondingly here here a was the area of cross section here you have the j which is the polar moment of inertia and here you have the young's modulus e and here you have the shear modulus j and analogically also if you see these formulas look more or less the same so delta pl by ae p pl by jg right they look more or less the same analogically they are predicting the same thing one of them is, is predicting the longitudinal deformation and the other one is predicting the angle of twist right okay now going a step further do you remember that what this particular terminology was called ae yes it was called the axial rigidity right and why was it called the axial rigidity because if you have a structure where your a is high e is high you will have the delta is smaller and smaller because it's inversely proportional right so it is making your uh, shaft or your rod more rigid to deformation that's why you have the axial rigidity 
Similarly, if you come to the right hand side over here, take a look at the denominator Jg, right? This Jg that you have, the higher the value of Jg, lesser will be your angle of twist because it's inversely proportional to phi, right? And also, higher the Jg means you are making the structure or making your circular shaft in this particular case torsionally more rigid to resist this angle of twist that you have. So, what is Jg going to be called? You are right. If Ae is axial rigidity, Jg as torsional. You see so many similarities. Torsional. Now you will see that once you have established this analogy, some of the concepts that you have studied in axial loading, for example, the indeterminate structure, right? Uh, when you had structures where uh, you had uh, non-uniform axial loading, so you will see that similar cases can arise in the case of torsion, and analogically you can solve it in a very similar way. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the problems. For example, the first one. Do you remember the axial case what I have given here? So we are going to look at non-uniform torsion, but please recall the case of the non-uniform axial loading. It is still determinate over here. But for this one, do you remember that the delta that we had calculated, how did we calculate the delta? Here, what we had done is that we had at every section, every discontinuity that was there in between those discontinuities we had at the cross sections we had calculated the internal forces n and our eventual delta that is here this total delta of this whole bar so here this delta is actually delta ac right delta ac was some of the deltas of these individual portions right so if my from a to b over here was maybe portion 1, if B to C was portion 2, then I can go ahead and write that delta AC, that is the total delta, is summation of delta I over here, which is delta 1 and delta 2, which becomes equals to Ni Li by Ai Ei. Right? Now come to the torsion problem and see analogically how much it is going to help you. In this torsion problem, what you have, it is a non-uniform torsion. You have different torques are acting at different uh, points on this uh, particular shaft that is there A, B, C, D. Now this shaft remember it has a circular section and it has another circular section which has a higher cross sectional area. So it is non-uniform from that perspective as well. So here how are we going to solve it exactly in a similar fashion as we solved here. Here also what am I what I am going to do is that I can come and then I can in between the discontinuities I can cut the sections right so here I will have three sections here right so for the first one second one third one right? so for the first one I can do I can draw the free body diagram now if I just separate out this part over here on the left I have a T1 and suppose the internal torque TAB, let me call the internal torque as T I and T maybe just for the you know sake of discussion. So the internal torque T I and T in the section 1 is TAB over here. If I cut another section 2 over here, the internal torque there is TBC. So here T I and T comma 2 is your T over here and lastly if you got a torque over here now remember here also if you want to make your life simple you probably should just take the right hand part of the of this shaft to draw the free body diagram otherwise you can do here as well so here also i have t kernel 3 your tcd right now going back in the similar analogy as we had over here in this particular case what is going to be my P for section 1 for this for this part 1 over here which is between A to B that is part where they, this is the angle of twist in A P right what is this going to be this is simply going to be nothing but the same formula the torsion formula that is the 
TL divided by JG. Now I'm going to consider the internal torque as I did over here. I consider the internal axial forces. So it is going to be T1, right, times that length of that particular section times LAB divided by J of AB. Remember the J, the polar moment for circular depends upon the radius times G, right, of AB. If suppose they are made of, you know, different materials, they have different shear model. So, similarly, you can calculate your P of 2, which is for the section B to C, then phi of 3, which is for the section C to D, over here. So, what is going to be my total phi? Remember, total phi is the total angle of twist that you are having from the one extreme to the other. Here, this delta was the total deformation from A to C. Here, the total phi is going to be from A to D over here. So, my total phi, right, if I have to explicitly further explicit, right, from A to D is going to be summation of the Pi, right, which is simply going to be my summation of P each internal torque comma i times the length of the of each of these segments in the first one it is L A B then L B then L C D right divided by J I I. So you see analogically it is so similar. So if you have properly understood and if you have learned the derivation for the axial case, doing it for the case of the pure torsion is actually pretty. Let's go ahead and look at some of the further analogies which are there. Remember this one where we had the continuous gradation of the uh, area and if you have you know a, a, a body force that is being applied we had cut a small section dx and calculated the internal forces and so on. Here also it is going to be the exactly the same thing. In, in the axial case you calculated the deformation. In this particular case you are going to calculate the phi and you can take the free body diagram and you can calculate it and you solve it and you see that eventually the integral comes out to be one and the same. Analogically again going to be 0 to L right T kernel point x x divided by a x right assuming it's the mean of the same material. So, analogically again very similar to what we had derived over here, what we had derived over here internal force, internal torque, length of dx divided by the modulus of uh, shear modulus times the uh, your polar moment of inertia. Right? Okay, all right, so let, let's move ahead. Now, remember that we had also seen for the actual case that the stresses on the inclined section. So, how did we do that? In that one, what we had done was that uh, we had taken section cut at a certain angle for which the normal was making a certain angle of theta, right? And we had looked at two extremities for which the normal force becomes maximum and the shear becomes maximum. See, this is also was the section where we sort of looked at that uh, if a bar is under pure axial loading, it is not true that no matter where you look and how you look in the bar, all elements are going to be under axial loading. It depends upon the angle you are looking at, right? So, if you are looking at an angle which is perpendicular, the longitudinal axis then yes you are only going to have the normal stresses but if you are looking at elements which are slanted at a particular angle right which you have one particular theta they are going to have both the axial as well as the shear strains a couple of special cases for that was that this that shear strain it becomes maximum when the theta was equal to 45 degrees so if you had taken an element like this over here where all the faces were you know 45 45 40, 45 like you know in between you have the 90 degree angles over here right you were having this element which was having a normal force of sigma x over 2 and a shear force of sigma x over 2. now remember 
Shear force equals to sigma x over 2 did not mean that the shear force has become a normal force. It just means the magnitude of the tau has become the normal force divided by 2. Right? Now let's look at the case of the of, of the of the torsion. In torsion, if you do a similar thing, here in the torsion also, if you take an element which is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis, right? This element over here. You are simply going to have the torques or the other simply going to have the shear stresses tau. Here, when we took a perpendicular element, it was just the sigma x because of this p. Here, because of the applied torque, my all these you know, rectangular elements on the surface of my member are in a case of pure shear. If I take any element whose face perpendicular to the longitudinal axis, I am going to get this tau over here. Right? This is in 3D and this is in, in 2D. So the 3D. Diagram if you have taken a you know, small chunk over there and this is 2D. I'm looking at it. Now, as I did over here, if I come to this particular member now and if I start cutting angles at different you know, different slopes, right? What do I get? Let's see. Well, if we start cutting angles at a different slope, so here I'm not going to go into the further details. Of deriving all these equations and arriving at the final, you know, formula. If you, you can take a look at any standard textbook, it is just you know a lot of algebraic bookkeeping that is going to happen. But I am going to give the gist of it, following which it is very easy to draw the or to write the equilibrium equation. So here, what I have done is that you have we have cut an angle. Uh, we have cut uh, this this member over here, the the entire the the you know uh, section plane. To which the normal, so this is the your normal vector which makes an angle of theta to the horizon, exactly in a similar analogy to what we did for the pure axial case. Now, once you have that, and from the stresses you like the forces, remember this particular phase by A divided by cosine of theta and so on. In the end, what you get that is for this kind of a you know, configuration, what you will get this sigma theta that you see over here come boils down to tau sine to theta and your tau theta this particular shear over here becomes equals to tau cosine of 2 theta. Now what can you what can you uh, sort of decode from here? See what we hypothesize that if I was taking the plane which was perpendicular to my longitudinal axis right my I did not have any axial stress I had only shear tau. So that means if my normal is exactly aligned here, that is my theta equals to zero, right? So if in these equations we put theta equals to zero, what do I get? I get tau of theta equals to tau, and I get sigma theta when theta equals to zero becomes equals to zero. It vanishes. So I get back to you know what are what was my original configuration there, right? That's the case where you're taking an element like this. Now where now the question is that now so for this configuration of sigma is zero sigma theta is zero right because if you put a zero over here it becomes zero for what angle or what theta here does my normal stress become maximum this normal stress sine to theta the maximum value is one over here and it becomes maximum when again when similar analogically when theta equals to 45 degrees so maybe let's just write it over here so sigma theta becomes equals to sigma maximum at theta equals to 45 degrees so what happens at 45 degrees if i put a 45 degrees over here in that case this one becomes sigma max becomes equals to tau. Again, please be clear about this that sigma max equals to tau doesn't mean that your normal stress is becoming shear stress. It is just that the magnitude of the normal stress becomes equals to the magnitude of the shear stress that section experiences when applied to the torque T over here, right? And at theta equals to 45 degree again, what happens to my tau of theta? Very interesting. At 45 degree, this cos to theta becomes cos 90. So tau of theta at theta equals to 45 degree becomes zero. So essentially shear vanishes, right? So tau of theta at theta equals to 45 degrees 
comes tau of theta becomes equals to zero right so how does that look like so if you if you you know take a look at this one how it looks like is essentially something like this if i am taking an element to which the perpendicular for which the this section is perpendicular longitudinal axis i have only the taus across the faces no axial stress whereas if i am taking a 45 degree angle as i just derived in the previous page i am going to have thing like this over here i am going to have a maximum maximum sigma which is going to be equals to this tau over here right and my shear vanishes so it's it's such an interesting scenario where you are having this circular shaft where every rectangular element is having pure shear but within the same shaft if you are looking at an angle of 45 degree those elements aligned at 45 degree are only experiencing normal stress, right? And this is again very important when you are applying torque to members are poor in tension and compression. Remember, this sigma over here is nothing but a tensile force, and this sigma over here is nothing but a compressive force, right? So even though your material may be good in shear, if the material is particularly weak tension or in compression. Classic example are some brittle materials. In that case, you are going to have a failure. Right? A classic example I will show you right now using uh, our very common classroom chalk. So this is a classroom chalk. Right? So to this chalk that is there, if I am applying a torsion at both the ends, I am not pulling or pushing. I am simply applying a torsion, and this is a brittle material which is weak in tension as well as compression. Mostly in tension, compression it may be better, but if I just apply this one and if I, you see at what angle it failed over here, it failed at that 45 degree angle over here. You see this uh, kind of an angle which has which it has made over here, and you can see over here, right? So this one fails at an angle of 45 degree. This material may be good in shear, but and how can I tell it is good in shear? You take a piece of chalk and you take a knife and you try to cut it. You will, you will experience substantial amount of resistance, which tells me that this piece of chalk is probably quite good in shear. But this chalk again is not very good in tension or you know maybe in compression, mostly in tension, it is not very good. That's why when I applying the torque at those locations, at those angles, right, where I'm having uh, this maximum tau. So this is again the you know, figuratively if I have to explain, you start to have the crack at the 45 degree plane and the chalk snaps at 45 degree angle. When you when some of you go back to your uh, you know, the, the, the campus, you can try to do this experience in your you can try to do this experiment rather classrooms that is really it's a fun experience, right? Okay. Okay, so the last thing on this uh, topic is that so we have looked at the non-uniform case, non-uniform but deterministic. Then we have also looked at the, the stresses at the inclined sections. The last case which is over here is the statically indeterminate case. So what you see in this statically indeterminate case is that similar to the actual loading case, you have a shaft which may have different cross section and it's clamped at this end and this here so these points a and b do not move relative to each other that means if you calculate the phi a b the relative movement of b with respect to a over the total angle of twist is going to be equal to zero similar to what you had in one over here so remember here my compatibility and we are going to again remember the equations of compatibility that your delta a c for this particular portion and delta BC for this particular portion was overall equal to zero. That delta AB was delta AC plus delta CB was equals to zero. And you had maintained the equilibrium and so on, and you had eventually derived what are the reactions. Similarly, for the case of the torque, we can also write the equilibrium equation for this one. Here you see the internal torque T naught. Now the sign, the directions are important. If you do your finger curling for the T naught, you will see. That the double arrow for T naught points towards this direction, and these are your reaction torques that you have here. So I can write here I have my T A plus T B equals to zero, right? 
and what is the compatibility the compatibility is that your phi of ac the first part phi of ac plus phi of cb the total phi total angle of twist between a and b that is equals to zero because those two ends are clamped right so we have the phi of ac plus your phi of cb will be equals to zero now, if you write it a few steps further, what do you get? What you get is your P of AC is nothing but T, the internal torque which is acting over there. That is T, I am going to write T internal AC times length of AC divided by J of AC times G, assuming the material is the same throughout, right? And plus is going to be for this one here going to be T internal EB times length of CP divided by J of CP times G, right? And this equals to zero over here. Now you have two equations, this equation over here and this equation over here. Of course, you realize that this internal torque you have to write in terms of what you get here. For example, in the in for the for the for the section AC, if you cut a section over here, and if you draw the free body diagram, how does that look like? The free body diagram would be on the left, you have torque A, the reaction torque that is acting. So to compensate that in the section AC, so this is my section AC. Yeah. Right. To compensate that on the right side, I must have the balancing torque that is internal it must be equals to TA. Right. Similarly, you can write for the section CB. So you will have you know two equations. So eventually, this equation you can write in terms of the reaction or the torque which is applied, and you have another equation over here. You can solve both of them to get the reactions you that you want you can get those internal deformations also you can get the phi ac and you can and you will see when you add them up it must equal to zero because you have to satisfy the compact now that we have learned about the cases of the non-uniform torsion and the structures the indeterminate structures under the torsion problems let's go ahead and look at one application example